they don't underestimate the 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 power of personal branding because my personal experience of creating the podcast was just it was just night and day you know you go from this unknown individual uh, intern researcher you know I was like you know in my mid 30s uh, you know you go from you know a nobody to suddenly somebody who a lot of people want to speak to and that really does open doors because suddenly you've got all these contacts you can engage with them on social media people see that you're offering value up front you're just giving value you're not asking for anything in return other than you know like some time with them you get to learn from them you get to have these really engaging conversations with people there are just so many benefits you know you improve your ability to speak with people of that caliber um, and it just it just gives you a lot of opportunities to to I don't know just to elevate your profile to ele- to to grow um, personally and uh, and it's just great it's just great for business both while you're doing the podcast and also in the future as well it's like it sets you up for for success. Hey everyone, this is Devin Miller here with another episode of The Inventive Journey. I'm your host, Devin Miller, a serial entrepreneur that's grown several startups into seven and eight figure businesses, as well as a founder and CEO of Miller IP Law, where he helps startups and small businesses with their patents and trademarks. If you ever need help with yours, just go to strategymeeting.com, grab some time with us to chat, and we're always here to help. Now, today we've got another great guest on the podcast, Carl Robinson. And uh, Carl is uh, from the UK um, during high school, went, or was a pretty normal, uh, went to normal public school for a period of time. And then in, in quotes, uh, went to a fancy private school for a couple of years before going off to college, um, then got a job at Accenture. And then after three years, a friend in uh, China told him about, or told him he should move to China and do a startup with them. Um, so moved to China for, and uh, did that for about seven years, uh, tried a couple different startups with a friend, um, a translation company and an and uh, an app company ended up selling off the app company for a, a small amount of money and then decided to do a health startup in India um, maybe and, uh, and along the way also met his girlfriend moved back to France um, worked for as a data scientist for six years then joined an incubator and started what he's doing now which is uh, Rumble Studios with uh, or using our conversational AI so with that much as an introduction welcome on the podcast Carl Hey Devin, it's great to be here. Thanks very much for the for the recap of my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have I, I have that innate ability to take everybody's life and condense it down to 30 seconds. So maybe I'll start a business in and of itself where I, I do that as a eulogy and I can tell uh, tell everybody's life story <laughs> in 30 seconds. But yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I took a much longer journey and condensed it into the 30 second version. So why don't we unpack that a bit and tell us a little bit about uh, how your life got uh, started in the UK, starting at the, the public school and then going to the the in quote quote fancy private school yeah sure so um i mean just listening to my life there it's it's definitely i've had a, a range of experiences i could say that and you know I, I was throwing myself into doing different things and the the fancy fr- private school was one of those different things you know i went to a normal school up until i was 16 um managed to get a scholarship to this uh, expensive private school in oxford called st edwards which is a, an amazing school really cool people beautiful surroundings and, and facilities uh, and it was a, a real uh, chance for me to see how the other side live you know it's uh, um, the people there have different attitudes you know they come from different backgrounds and uh, to be able to uh, do my schooling in both those environments in a standard British comprehensive and then in a, in a confusingly named public school which is actually a private school um, mm. it was uh, I think it's very enriching and uh, and I recommend it I think it's uh, something that you know a lot of people would get benefit from but very few have the opportunity to do. So now, no, and I think that, you know, it's interesting. I, I just went to the normal public school. So I, I mm-hmm. or what, or, and so I, I didn't have the chance to do the fancy private school other than I watch or watch them in the movies or on t- mm-hmm. TV shows. But I think it sounds like a, an interesting and, uh, and uh, unique opportunity. So now you went to high school, graduated and went to college and you mind us, what did you study in college or kind of what did you, what did you do at that point? Yeah, so after St. Edwards, I went to Manchester because I needed to get out of Oxford. Oxford's a beautiful place, and uh, but it's quite small. There's only like 100,000 or so people there, and it's very academic. And so I wanted to see the big city. So the, a big city for me at the time was Manchester. So I went up north, uh, studied computer science uh, in, uh, in Manchester University. I got an amazing computer science department there uh, three years um, uh, before then getting a job with Accenture, like you said. So now, you, and you, so you start Accenture, and I think you said you did that for about three years. Is that right? Yeah, that's it. Just over three years. Got promoted to consultant. Um, it was uh, it's an eye opener. You work really hard at Accenture. I tell you, so it's not 
it's, it's a pretty good first job because, you know, when you come out of uni, you don't really know what you're doing. I certainly didn't uh, have a clue what I wanted to do. Wasn't really keen on becoming a programmer, even though I was, uh, you know, had the computer science degree. Uh, so it made sense to go into something like consulting, which paid pretty well. I managed to pay off all my student debt. Um, and uh, tried a few different, you know, different roles for, within that organization. But after three years, um, I decided that it wasn't wasn't going to be the path for me going forwards. I um, also had a, you know, family tragedy, which kind of pushed me to to soul search a bit and, you know, decide, you know, what is it that I really want to do? You know, life is short. And uh, and this was when the, the China opportunity came up. And I thought, why not? You know, so that's why I went for it. Yeah. And let's or just on that note. So, you know, China opportunity came up. It sounds like Maybe you weren't necessarily specifically looking for that opportunity in of itself, right. but you were looking for kind of a change or, hey, Accenture was a great ability to pay off student loans, get some experience, but it wasn't what you wanted to do longer term. And so with that, you know, was it one where you were kind of letting your network know that you're looking for opportunities and somebody said, mm -hmm. hey, you should go do China? Or is it kind of just a friend out of blue said, hey, I've got a great opportunity in China. And he said, great, I want something different. Let's go, let's go have an adventure kind of. How did that work out or how to, or what motivates you to, to go that path? Yeah, it was more of the second one. It was, uh, you know, I was, I was aware that I was not happy with where I was. Um, but I didn't have any specific plans in mind. I, you know, I always wanted to start a business. So I had, you know, like vague ideas of, you know, uh, starting something, I was listening to Tim Ferriss and, you know, the four hour work week and all this kind of stuff, you know, so I was already, my mind was already primed for, for doing something, going out on my own rather than working in a big company, but I wasn't really sure what. Um, and then my, my friend Guy was uh, already living in China and said, you know, you got to come over. It's super cheap to live here. Um, you know, the rent is only a hundred bucks a month and, uh, you know, you can live, uh, you know, live like a king, try all sorts of different things, you know, like have fun and, uh, and we could look at doing uh, some kind of business thing together at the same time. I thought it sounded like a great opportunity, knew nothing about China whatsoever, like couldn't tell you the first thing about it, um, but thought, why not? <laughs> no, just uh, so, curious, and you touched on it, what was the opportunity that he was pitching? In other words, I get China maybe is less expensive, the mm. land of opportunity, if you want to call it, you know, whatever that was, but what was, did, was there a business or an opportunity he was specifically pitching on, or, just, or was it more of just, hey, you should come to China, we'll figure something out? Yeah, it was that. It was come to China, we'll figure it out. You know, it's kind of land of opportunity 2009. So China was still going, I mean, it still is, but it, at that time it was really undergoing a lot of very fast change. And uh, and uh, it was a great place to be as, as a foreigner as well. So you could always get a job doing various jobs that, you know, <laughs> they give to the, the foreigners over there. You can teach English, you know, you can, uh, you know, a lot of people want to want to work with you just from the fact that you're foreign. It's less the case now. Um, and because you can uh, earn more relative to the the standard wage over there it gives you a lot more free time so it gives you the freedom really to explore your ideas and this was the big thing for me at the time you know I was what 26 something like that and with Accenture you know you're working 10 12 hour days constantly like and so the weekend comes you're exhausted there's just no way you're starting a business at the same time as doing that but with mm. China it's the opposite you know you can work you know a couple of days a week as an English teacher and earn enough to live comfortably uh, and then you've got the rest of the time to do whatever you want. So I was doing martial arts, you know, I was like looking after myself, I was in, improving myself in different ways, you know, learning languages, socializing more uh, and starting a business. So it was like a, a real period of growth for me. So no, and I think that, you know, sometimes it's just, hey, I don't know exactly what I'm going to do, but I, I can go, I can earn enough money to, you know, live off of or to, 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 uh, to have, you know, take care of the expenses. And then it gives you the breathing room in the meantime, where especially if you're only having to work, you know, a few days a week and, and having that flexibility to then kind of explore what would you want to do or what if you, when you have that bandwidth, kind of what that would look like. So totally. now as you're doing that and you go over to China, you start doing kind of English teaching, you have, you know, fairly inexpensive costs. What kind of did you go to or start to explore? or kind of what were the startups or the opportunities you started to go after? Yeah, so I started attending some some startup events. You know, there's they a, a pretty decent startup scene there. Um, and when I was there in 2009, a lot of the events were in English. They were run by, you know, Westerners or there was a very Western feel. And then as China developed and they became more and more independent, you know, things became more and more Chinese. And so it became harder and harder for a Westerner. But when I got there in 2009, there was a lot of stuff going on. So, you know, I, I explored that, made a few contacts. Um, but then really just sat down with my friend and decided that the kind of businesses that we wanted to set up, we wanted to set up a SaaS business, you know, because of the, the, the potential for it to scale. Uh, and uh, my friend was a translator. And so we thought doing something in the translation world would be a good idea because he had the domain ex expertise there. Um, I had 
uh, some some kind of product or technology expertise because I've done computer science. I worked in Accenture, so I feel like you know I'd seen the software de uh, development lifecycle uh, once or twice on different projects, not in a startup context, but still. Um, and so that's that's how really how we got started. Um, what maybe what we didn't do enough was uh, true customer development. We did some surveys um, and uh, re uh, you know secondary research like reading things online, posting on forums, this kind of thing. But we didn't, I don't think at the time we spoke to enough translators or people in the translation industry to really get a good feel of what the problems were and, and what needed to be solved. So that was one of the many, many mistakes we made as in our first uh, startup adventure uh, and just really sat down and did a lot of kind of brainstorming, ideating and second guessing um, and basically designing a solution coming out of ourselves, you know, like based on what we believed that the market wanted. No, I think that makes uh, makes sense. And sometimes, you know, you start a business and you think you have the domain expertise and it's a natural springboard. And then you get into it and either figure out, hey, I know how to do the work, but I don't know how to run a business in that or it doesn't work out or it's, you know, different than what you anticipated. So now that you're doing that and maybe that wasn't the, the ideal or it didn't work out in the long term. So you stayed in China for about seven years. And I think you also, in addition to doing the translation company, I think you mentioned, you correct me if I'm wrong, you also looked at doing an app or doing something along that lines? Yeah, that's right. So the, the translation idea called Hyperlingo was this uh, big hairy startup idea. It was like a translation marketplace, um, two-sided marketplace for translation you know, providers and their, and their clients. But uh, it was a big project that took a long time. It really dragged. We made, like I say, a lot of mistakes. We can talk about that in a bit. But so while that was after about the second year of doing that and it wasn't moving as quick as we uh, we wanted it to, uh, we, were, we were discussing doing some other ideas and my friend suggested doing doing an app, a simpler app. Um, and we decided on uh, something that would help you eat more healthily. So uh, a food, uh, or was it a fruit, fruit and veg tracker? Uh, at the time, there was a lot of these kind of things. So um, yeah, so we hired a, a designer and a, a programmer, both from the States, and they, they were both great to work with. We, we got really lucky with, with those. Um, I think they were one of, the, one of them was on recommendation, actually. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we've designed something that was super simple. It's just a way for you to, every time you ate some fruit or veg portion, you just log it. Uh, but the designer did a super, super job of the, the visuals. We had really great music in there. I even wrote a little poem in the about section. Like It was a real kind of labor of love, you know, a real... Um, a real project that we put our hearts into. Uh, we added some gamification as well, so you could track it, you could see a graph if you turn the phone sideways. Bearing in mind at the time I had a, an iPhone 3GS, I think, you know, this is a long time ago. Um, mm. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, and then uh, like, as, as you might have mentioned, uh, eventually once we, we launched it, we spent about six months building it, we launched it for free. Uh, it got a bit of traffic, got like a, a few thousand downloads. We thought this is great, you know, um, switched it to paid because we're like, we could be making a few thousand dollars a month, you know, like, it, mm. and uh, since we switched, switched it to paid, the, the downloads like really plummeted, you know, like the amount of people willing to pay for an app was far fewer than to download a free one. Um, and then it kind of fizzled out a little bit and we were like, hmm, no, that's the, the end of the adventure. Uh, we paid a thousand dollars, let's say a thousand dollars each between three friends to do it. So we're like, okay, well, you know, it was not, not that much lost. Uh, we 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 recouped about three thousand dollars in sales. We basically broke even based on the, the sales we've made. We're like, well, that was a good project. It was fun anyway. We learned a lot. And then mm. just at the point where it was fizzling out, uh, we got an email from some you know mysterious company <laughs> saying, uh, "Long story short, we love your app. Uh, how much do you want for it?" And we were like, "Wow, okay, this is it. We've hit it. We've hit the big time. Um, it would be great if we could double our money. You know, like maybe we could get six thousand dollars for it. And uh, you know that would that, that would be a real win." But then at the time, my uh, my friend Guy um, was reading a book called The Secrets of Power Negotiation. And uh, in, in that book, there are many gambits you can use. And one of them was um, always let the, the buyer offer the first price, never just go straight in with the price. We're like, okay, so let's just ask them how much they, they're willing to pay. And um, we, we sent them an email, carefully word, you know, poured over it for like an, over an hour, like a perfect hit send. Uh, and then very quickly, we got an answer back saying, uh, hey guys, uh, you know, we, we really love your app. We couldn't possibly pay you more than $200,000 for it. And we're like, okay, <laughs> literally just jumped out of our seats. Uh, might not sound like a lot by startup standards, but for, you know, three guys living in China, that is a mm. lot of money. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we, and then we spent the next six months basically selling the app, working with um, these bloodthirsty uh, American lawyers, uh, basically trying to get the IP trans transferred over, which you know uh, all about. And my goodness, sure. did they try and claw every dollar out of us. 
in the end, we actually rejected the, the quote that they gave us in the end because it was just absolutely ridiculous. They were charging us for every coffee the intern made uh, and they dropped the price considerably, uh, which was another uh, negotiation success, I have to say, <laughs> negotiating down the price of the lawyers. Uh, and we walked away with, I don't know what it was, like 180 or something in, after after all the, the expenses. But it was great. It was a great experience. Hey, no, that's a great experience. Hey, I think for <laughs> especially when you're starting out doing your first app or your first startup, if you can walk away and make a profit and, and uh, gain a, some good experience. I would always call that a win. And it sounds like yeah. you accomplished both of those. And so definitely a, a great opportunity. So now you so now you've done that. You built the app, you know, and I, I also kind of figure I also, you know, get that, you know, especially when you have an app, doing it as a paid app is a much different game than free. People are willing to try free stuff because they don't have any skin in the game other than they usually get advertised with. They sell all their information, but at least there's not money out of their pocket. But as soon as you ask them for money out of their pocket, they're a lot more judicious oh, yeah. about what apps they might sell. But nonetheless, you made, you know, you sold it off, made some money, made a bit of an exit. And then I think the next thing you mentioned was going to India to do a health startup. Is that right? It was, it, I didn't go to India, although I did visit. It was a, an American startup still in Beijing who oh, okay. were building an app. So it was a mobile health startup building an app for Indian diabetics, <laughs> believe it or not, but from China, which was probably one of their big mistakes, actually. So being close to your customers is something that's super important. Uh, and when you're trying to build something for a, you know, a group of people that you don't really understand or know and are miles away from, uh, it makes things a lot harder. Uh, I did get a chance to go to India. I did this tour of the five cities in India over two weeks, which was really uh, interesting and grueling at the same time. Um, but uh, yeah, it was it was basically based in Beijing. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So now you do that, do that for a period of time. Um, and then as you're doing that, I think along the way you mentioned, you met the girlfriend, you moved again, um, moved back to, or moved to France and then worked with the, as a data scientist for a little bit of time. Yeah, and there was a course in between. So um, my job in, in, in Beijing was a, as a product manager. I was there for about 18 months. That was the best job I've ever had. So I'd highly recommend if anyone's thinking of working in a startup and they're, they're not interested in being a programmer, try and be a product manager because it's, it's just a great job. Um, but then uh, that startup um, didn't succeed in the end. So that was kind of the, the trigger for, for leaving China. Um, and uh, yeah, I was with my girlfriend. She's French. Um, I happen to have French nationality as well. So we were looking to come back to Europe. France was the obvious choice. Uh, I wanted to do a, a master's degree to sort of bring my technical skills up again, um, not necessarily to become a data scientist, just because, you know, it was a challenge, you know, a personal challenge, you know, I wanted to do something a bit more technical. It seems like whatever job I'm in, I always want to do the opposite. So when I'm a product manager, I want to get more involved in the tech. And when I'm doing programming, I want to get away from it and do something else. Uh, but anyway, I did this two year um, data science masters uh, in France, half of which was in French. Um, and that was a real challenge, I have to say, like, um, definitely stretch my brain and, and they work you really hard in France, but very, very affordable. You know, it was, I think it was uh, 5,000 euros for, for, for two years to do the masters, which is nothing compared to the UK and definitely nothing compared to the, the U S um, and, uh, and then, yeah, I got a job, uh, Dassault system for, for six months after that, which is this big, you know, uh, well-known company, defense company in, um, in France. So it's, it looks great on the CV, but again, I was back in a big company reminded a bit, reminded me a bit of being in uh, working at Accenture. And I was just like, yeah, this is again, not for me. So quit that joined entrepreneur first, which is a fantastic, uh, startup incubator, met my co-founder Joris and started Rumble Studio. No, I think that's awesome. So now you're doing data scientists. Now, how did you get into rumble studio getting into an incubator in other words is it hey i've got a great idea and i want to pursue it and i'm going to apply to go to an incubator or was it more of hey i want to do a startup i don't have that idea yet i'll figure it out as an incubator kind of walk us through what was that process to, to arrive at rumble studio yeah so normally incubators accelerators that's how they work right you have to you have to have a, a bit of a team a prototype you have to go there and pitch it and then hopefully you get in and they'll give you some resources but um, I was in France, I didn't really know that many people. Um, and fortunately, I, I came across uh, this entrepreneur first uh, incubator, because they reached out to me on uh, on LinkedIn, they've got a great kind of outbound process. Um, and they were looking for startup -y types uh, living in Paris to join their, their cohort. And it was really great timing, you know, because I was at the point where I was looking for an opportunity like that. And not only that, but they're, they're unique in that you don't need to have a, a co-founder and an idea and a prototype when you go mm -hmm. in. I had an idea um, because taking a step back when I was doing my master's degree uh, for the last six months, you do an internship. I was, I was doing that 
uh, working on machine learning models in conversational AI. And that was in the lab at a, a place called IRCAM, which is um, mostly focused on music research, but they have a, a speech research department as well. Anyway, I was, I was there coding on my own um, and at the same time launched this podcast called The Voice Tech Podcast, which is all about conversational AI, smart speakers, which at the time was you know, really uh, on, on the rise. Uh, and it's done a, an amazing job in boosting my profile, putting me into contact with loads of people. It's a fantastic thing to do. Um, in doing that, uh, I realized how much work podcasting really is. It was just consuming my entire weekend every, every time. Um, and because I was talking about all this conversational AI stuff, uh, the idea occurred to me to put the two worlds together and try and use the latest voice technology to make podcasting easier, basically automate the process of, of podcasting in some way. Um, and so, yeah, so that's really, uh, that's really where, that's what led me, led me through that. Um, and then, uh, then after IRCAM, yeah, it was Dasso and then Entrepreneur First. And so when I went into Entrepreneur First, I, um, I had an idea in mind already from that experience, but not really sure how to build it, not really sure what it was going to look like, certainly didn't have anything in terms of a prototype and I didn't have a co-founder. Uh, and the way Entrepreneur First works is they, they run in the first phase, they run these kind of matchmaking events where you, and they have a, a clean split between technical and non-technical people. I think there were 60 in the cohorts, there's 30 of each. Uh, and then you, you basically pair up, have chats, pitch to each other, and you do this kind of rapid process of iteration where you're kind of making and breaking little teams, ideating, pitching, um, to try and find a co-founder that you have some kind of fit with, both in terms of like ideas, but also complementary skills, ambition, and, and all the rest. Uh, and that's that's really what makes it unique. And that's how I found uh, my co-founder, Joris Gary, who's uh, now the CTO of Rumble Studio. Awesome. No, that uh, definitely sounds like a, an awesome, uh, a fun journey. So maybe mm -hmm. just a follow up to that. So now that you've, you so you went through that process, had the idea, found a, a good co-founder that can, you know, that you work well together with, it would be a good match. And you all, you know, you start to work and say, how can we make podcasting simpler, right? Or make it a better process or more streamlined and fluid and, and mm -hmm. overall a better product. And so you come up with that. Now there are a lot of podcasts out there. There's also a lot of tools, a lot of platforms and all those type of things. So as you're looking to get, or get that launch, build it out and otherwise uh, differentiating yourself, how has it gone so far? Is it one where it's been a straight uh, rocket ship to the top and everybody's using your product and your millionaires, you know, overnight, or is it one where it's been a bumpy road and trying to pivot and figure out how, or how to market it and how to reach the customers or somewhere in between or kind of, how did that go for you? Yeah, it's somewhere in between, in between, I would say we're, we're definitely not millionaires yet. Um, but I, I wouldn't say that we've pivoted either. Like Joris and I were one of the few teams that never broke up. Like it was the first person that I paired with and uh, we hit it off. We had similar vision. Joris had exactly the the skills that I didn't, and therefore, you know, we stuck. We had a lot of time to sort of do the customer development. Also, I had an idea that I really wanted to explore. You know, I was looking to to explore this idea first and foremost. Um, and so we did a lot of customer development. We spoke to like more than hundred people. Um, I don't know whether there was, a, well, there probably was quite a lot of confirmation bias. You know, when you speak to people and be like, "So do you have this problem? You do? Great. Okay, we're going to build that then. That's what we wanted to build." Um, mm -hmm. But uh, we did we did make an effort to speak to a lot of people in lots of different niches that might need to create audio more quickly. So brands, agencies, PR people, um, journalists, like, you know, you've got a lot of ideas at that, that stage. And we still do, to be honest, you know, we're still building a tool that could be used by all these different people. But who do you really focus on? Like, who do you double down on? What's your marketing message going to be? You know, who's it going to be for? These are the real the real um, problems we're trying to solve. Um, mm because we had to pitch to the the entrepreneur first jury so did all these conversations um and then slowly kind of refined our idea um and then yeah at the end of the first phase pitched it uh entrepreneur first the three panelists or well, two of the three liked it <laughs> fortunately and so we got through and we got that first investment from that incubator which was uh, ninety thousand euros uh, and that really set us on our way so now, now almost fast forward just to the present days, and that was a, definitely a, a fun to hear kind of how that all went. Where's the company at today? Product launch, people can use it, people can buy it, still going, getting ready to launch, having a lot of customers in all 50 or all the countries worldwide, or kind of give us an idea, bring us up to speed as to where it's at today. Yeah, so we've, we've just done a, a, our first kind of soft launch in, in May, where the doors are open, you know, Stripe is connected, uh, it works, you know, you can go through the process from, from, from end to end, you can uh, plan, uh, record, uh, do a, a, a rough cut edit and export audio 
using uh, an asynchronous uh, interview system, which is which is fantastic. We've got a number of customers using it now, a number of paying customers as well. We've got about close to about a thousand signups in total on the app, um, and we've got. I don't know, uh, a handful of, of paying customers across a, a wide spectrum of, uh, of uh, tariffs from $9 a month on the, the lowest tariff up to kind of custom podcast productions for, for $5,000 that we've, you know, we've secured. So that involves some services, some editing and things. So we've experimented with some uh, adding some services to it to get the first users uh, uh, being able to get a, a great result. We've got a, a fully self-service offering at nine or ninety-nine dollars a month for for people who are able to just do it on their own, um, and we're we're most you know most concerned with basically getting feedback from those early customers. It's more about the feedback and the usage than it is the money. Um, and I'm fortunate to have you know creators, podcasters who've launched uh, episodes created exclusively on Rumble Studio, um, and one just recently uh, an agency who's done an entire podcast series um, commissioned by the Vatican uh, no less um, interviewing uh, influencers in the in the Latino uh, Catholic space um, mm -hmm. using Rumble Studio so fully asynchronous create an interview in Rumble you send them the link uh, and then these influencers are one by one answering the same questions and they're publishing those uh, as episodes so it's really exciting to see the product now being used concretely it's a useful tool for people they're willing to give their money on a monthly basis they're renewing um, but We've got a, our next big launch where we're putting a lot of marketing effort into it on July 26th. We've actually got a lifetime deal coming up. I can't say more than that, um, but it's a, an incredible offer for our first. We're looking to get out, you know, our first 500 customers, let's say, on the on the platform. Uh, and so we're doing this amazing lifetime deal um, to to give people like a one time you know one time purchase to get unlimited permanent use of Rumble Studio for life. And so if you're interested in that, you've got to check out our blog, you know, keep in touch with uh, Rumble Studio uh, on our channels uh, and you'll see us announce that soon. Awesome. Well, I definitely encourage everybody to check that out. Definitely a great opportunity to, to or if you're in the podcast space or, or plan on being it. So mm. now as we've caught up a, a bit to the, the present day and, and kind of uh, and heard where, or, or learned a lot about your journey, always a great time to transition to the two questions I ask at the end of each episode. So we'll jump to those now. Mm. First question I always ask is, is along your journey, what was the worst business decision you ever made and what'd you learn from it? Oh wow! Well, um, so, Hyperlingo, the 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 four year startup project in there in China that just never never ended, uh, really dragged on because we put all our faith in uh, in outsourcers. Um, I, this is probably one of the biggest mis mistakes I made because it was a mistake we kept making month mm. after month, year after year, and and combined with that, it was a cho it was a choice of co founder. So Guy, who's a good friend. Um, him and I are very similar. So we don't really have complementary skill sets where neither of us could build an app. So we had to find someone to build it. We could have got a technical co-founder, but like we say, we, we didn't know that many people in, in Beijing who could build an app. Obviously there are millions of Chinese people who can build great apps, but we didn't know them. So we ended mm -hmm. up going with um, uh, an outsourcer who was living in China at the time, running an agency and basically just dumped a lot of money and said, can you build this? And he said, yes. And then just deprioritized it over a period of months and years and it was just a and it was just a, an excruciating experience waiting for these little features to drip in and you know there was like weeks or months would go by without any change on the app and it was just absolutely the wrong move to to put your entire success of your startup in some outsourcer who's not fully invested in the project um mm. yeah i would say don't do that and we actually <laughs> switched from this guy to another set of outsourcers who were much more expensive us based this time um, who were great and they could really build product, but they were so expensive that by the time we built the, the MVP that was kind of ready to launch in inverted uh, commas, uh, we'd run out of money. <laughs> so it's just, you just can't do it like that. I mean, you, I mean, some people do, I know some people do find like amazing freelancers. You get some, someone off at work in Ukraine or someone who's just amazing and they can just churn out the features and for maybe for simpler apps, this works, but for us, it just, we just burn money and time. And it was just a, a massive lesson. And this is why I, I, I joined Entrepreneur First to find a, a true co-founder who was committed, as committed as I was to the project. You could actually build this, this MVP and build the business. 
No, and I think that that's, you know, it's an easy mistake to learn or to make, but it's also, it's a difficult one because, you know, on the one hand, you go, you know, and I'll take US based, you go with the US based programmer and you go with a reputable company, they're probably going to give you a good product, but you're going to are likely going to pay a very high premium to get that product. And yet you go outsourcing one is you have a time difference, you have language barrier, they may not be mm -hmm. as committed, they're probably not as caring as much about the reputation reviews in general, and there's always exceptions. And you're, you know, in your balancing it, but they're less expensive. And so you're saying now where you know, where do I balance that of do I go with a less expensive option? that maybe you know may work out or it may be a terrible experience or to go with a more expensive option which I, i'll probably i'm you know more likely to get a good product but i may never be able to afford it and it may run me dry and then, then the company will never launch and so i think that's always that balance and you have to learn the mistakes of how do you figure out who is if you're going to outsource how you would outsource it correctly if you're not going to outsource mm -hmm. who do you hire and, and and how do you keep it within our budgetary uh, restraints and so i think that's a great one to, to learn from and an easy mistake to make second question is is now if you're talking to somebody that's just getting into a startup or a small business what'd be the one piece of advice you'd give them i would say don't underestimate the the, the power of personal branding because my personal experience of creating the podcast was just it was just night and day you know you go from this unknown individual uh, intern researcher you know i was like you know in my mid-30s uh, you know you go from you know a nobody to suddenly somebody who a lot of people want to speak to and that really does open doors because suddenly you've got all these contacts you can engage with them on social media people see that you're offering value up front you're just giving value you're not asking for anything in return other than you know like some time with them you get to learn from them you get to have these really engaging conversations with people there are just so many benefits you know you improve your ability to speak with people of that caliber um, and it just, it just gives you a lot of opportunities to, to, I don't know, just to elevate your profile, to, ele to, to grow, um, personally. And, uh, and it's just great. It's just great for business, both while you're doing the podcast and also in the future as well. It's like, it sets you up for, for success. No. And I think that that's uh, definitely agree. I mean, I think that half the time, the connections I've made with this podcast is as much to the guests as it is to the listeners. And it gives you ability to network and meet new people and be able to, you know, half the time, the people that I refer out our clients to are people that I met on the podcast, or I'll ask the audience, hey, you know, or the guests or anybody else, hey, do you know of anybody that'll help this? And I think yeah. it just, there's a lot of benefits that you can be added if you're looking from the mindset of I'm going to give value to others as opposed to just expect that I get value from everybody else and they just give it to us. So I think that that's definitely a great, uh, great takeaway. Well, now, as we wrap up towards the end of the podcast, if people want to reach out to you, they want to be a customer, they want to be a client, they want to be an employee, they want to be an investor, they want to be your next best friend, any <laughs> or all of the above, what's the best way to reach out to you, contact you, find out more? Sure. So uh, check out Rumble Studio. It's just rumble.studio. Uh, you can email me directly, uh, Carl with a C at rumble.studio. Uh, we've got a newsletter, slash newsletter we've got a podcast slash podcast um and uh, like i say we've got that lifetime deal coming up so if you follow us on any of the social media channels just type in rumble studio look for the uh, yellow logo uh, and you can't miss us we're all over it and uh, and follow us there and, and you'll find out about that deal when it comes out Awesome. Well, I, uh, I think that's uh, definitely invite people to check it out. Sounds like a great tool and a great resource if you're in the podcast space or you're looking to get into it. Well, with that, thank you again for coming on the podcast. It's been a fun. It's been a pleasure. Now, for all of you that are listeners, if you have your own journey to tell and you'd like to be guests on the podcast, we'd love to have you. So just go to inventiveguest.com, apply to be on the show, and we'll look forward to chatting with you. Also, as a, uh, as a listener, make sure to click share, subscribe, and leave us a review because we want to make sure that everyone finds out about all these awesome journeys. Last but not least, if you ever need help with your patents, your trademarks, or anything else with your startup or your small business, just go to strategymeeting.com. Grab some time with us to chat, and we're always here to help. Well, thank you again for coming on the podcast and wish the next lady of your journey even better than the last. Thanks very much, Devin. Take care.